Hey. Welcome to Tony at 12. I'm Tony LeBlanc, and today I'm in conversation with Declan Godian, coxswain of the Alderney Lifeboat. And we're going to talk about the RNLI Bicentenary and what the Alderney Station is going to be offering in terms of special events this year. And then later on, Declan's also going to describe to us how a shout works. Good to see you, Declan. And you, Tony. And um, the large, one of the largest charities, and it covers the whole of the British Isles. It's an incredible organisation, isn't it? It is. And, um, you know, I think there are, well, there are 238 lifeboat stations um, throughout the, uh, the whole of the UK and Ireland. So, um, which is 450 lifeboats, of which that there are a handful of uh, hovercrafts with that as well for sort of uh, the mud, mud rescue areas. Um, and also, but I think what is, you know, very unique about the RNI, that is manned primarily by volunteers, of which there are, you know, just under 6,000 volunteers that actually you know, operate all of that service. So quite, quite, a, quite an, a, an amazing thing, really. And, and, you know, you've got to be pretty brave to be a volunteer, haven't you? Well, um, I'm most probably the wrong person to ask that because I think most lifeboat crews would say not. But um, no, I don't think you do. I mean, I think you have to clearly have, um, want to be part of a team and, yeah. and, and you know, want to, um, but what the RNLI does do is give you the best equipment to do the job and also the, the best training. So no one goes out there, um, you know, um, untrained to do to do those jobs. And thankfully, most of our jobs are, are routine. We'd rather be there earlier to stop things getting worse. But, um, you know, occasionally there are ones which are a bit trickier than others. But um, but no, I think, um, you know, uh, most lifeboat crew are, are very happy to, to do, do what they do. So we're talking about an organisation founded in 1824, currently celebrating 200 years. That's a hell of an achievement, isn't it? It is, yeah. And, um, you know, we've, we've had a, um, well, the start of the year, we, we, um, some people were very fortunate from here to, to go to uh, the ceremony in Westminster Abbey on, on the actual 4th of March, which was the actual day, you know, 200 years prior to that, that the RNLI was, was founded. Um, so that was a very, very special occasion to go there along with um, crews and volunteers, you know, crews and and all fundraisers throughout the RNI were represented there. So that was very special. And and what I think brought home to me was that, you know, it was um, 200 years ago that it was founded. And the, um, the sermon was given by the Archbishop of Canterbury, who, did, as you can imagine, did a fantastic job. It was very, very, um, yeah, very moving and, and funny. Um, but to think that his predecessor, 200 years prior to that, was actually on the committee in the ta London Tavern that, you know, um, with Sir William Hillary, the founder of the organisation, that came up with the charter of the RNI. So it's a really very sort of uh, unique uh, situation. And I think, um, you know, it really made me reflect on, on where it's come from. And it has from, you know, from very humble beginnings mm. um, where there was you know, only a handful of boats around the, around the, around the British Isles. But now, as we talked about earlier, you know, we've got um, 238 of them and a very big, well-established organisation. Yeah, that's very interesting. Now, we're almost into May, and I know that you've got various activities happening this year. Some of them have already happened. <laughs> so would you like to just briefly go over what's, what you've been up to? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean... We've uh, locally we've had our, our own church service here, which was um, attended by by lots of people from the island, and that was that was again very very moving. So we had that uh, um, earlier on uh, in in um, or sorry, rather later in um, in March. But we've got um, various things going on through the year. The 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 next thing we've got coming, which is actually um, not on a local basis, but this is from the RNI doing this um, throughout the region is or throughout the, the whole of the UK is there is a scroll which is going around to visit every single location. And it's basically designed to reflect and, um, and it represents the, the whole RNI community. So it's about, you know, fundraisers, guilds, all the people who do man the shops, not just operational lifeboat crews. So it gives everybody or each station the opportunity to make their mark on that scroll which is clearly will be a historical document to go in the archive of the RNI so we've got 
that is visiting the Channel Islands um, starting on Friday. So it's in Jersey on Friday, Guernsey on Saturday, and then it's coming up here on um, Saturday evening. And then there will be um, three three of us from um, uh, myself from the operational side of, of the team. And then um, uh, Margaret Storer, who is the, the chair of our, our guild here, and also Daphne MacDonald, who, who um, organizes the shop, will be signing the scroll on behalf of the Albany station. So we've got that happening on Sunday. Uh, and then as we go on, um, at the in uh, early next month, we've got a band concert at the Island Hall, which is um, being kindly being uh, being organised by the band and, and some and the choir as well. So we've got a little function going on there. And then as we go on through the year, we have got a, um, a black tie event in July, which is um, uh, an auction of promises as well to sort of uh, to raise some funds for the RNI as well as an awareness, awareness thing. And then we've got uh, the cavalcade this year. We will actually be having um, doing an RNI float. So we're going to have an attendance at that. So that we're looking forward to that. And then coupled with that, we've got our usual open day, which will have a slightly different um, twist on that this year with a few more things going on. Um, and that's more towards the end of uh, um, the end of August. Um, and then obviously we've still got the full range of um, uh, car boots and jumble sales and all the usual sort of data, you know, um, summer stuff that goes on with the RNI. So, um, and then we will have uh, an occasion as well in August in um, at a particular time um, at 1825 on um, uh, the, I think it's the 7th of August, 1825 being the time of, um, you know, the 200 year anniversary. And there is going to be a photograph that every lifeboat station will be having their photograph taken at that time. So again, that can go into an archive for the RLI just as a, as a memento of, of what the RNI looked like at one particular time in history uh, this year. So we've got that to do as well. So lots of things going on mm. and um, I'm sure we'll see you at some of those events as well. Hope to be there. Absolutely. I mean, presumably, as far as the photographs concerned, that'll be digitalized, won't it? So that people will. will have access to it, will they? Yeah, yeah, they will. And uh, as I say, it's, it's a, again, a, a quite a unique thing. It's going to be time so that every station, um, I think the RNI were looking at, um, you know, how you can sort of commemorate it th for every single station. And, you know, there, it, there were talks about clearly you can't launch every lifeboat because that's, you know, not the thing to do because there's a cost on that. And clearly boats will be out on on on, on rescues anyhow. So um, so they've come up with, I think that's most probably the 21st century way of doing it is take a digital photo. and um, um, But at least we can get that recorded that way. Yeah, so there we are. Now, you did say when we were talking about this um, interview that you would like to uh, do a thank you for the fundraising volunteers and everybody involved with the station. So can I leave you to do that? Well, absolutely. I mean, it, it um, we, you know, we are, um, we are very much one crew. And I mean, it's very easy to look at a lifeboat station and just think about, um, you know, all the fun bits, which are, you know, crews in life jackets and going out on big, you know, shiny orange and blue boats and doing a good job. But behind that, um, there are an awful lot of people that um, do a lot of hard work to raise all of the funds that that keep the R and I going. Um, you know, not just um, um, locally, but also you know, in, into the, the the bigger scheme of things. And it's you know, those people are often very unsung heroes of the R and I. They really are the true heroes in my book. So um, um, yeah, it goes without saying. You know, we're all. As, as operational crew, we're very thankful for all the work and stuff they do there. We clearly try and we try and support them as well where we can, and you know we're always there to to um, provide a bit of muscle and help stuff and, and and do things. But they do a fantastic job, and especially here, um, I think you know Margaret with such a small team, and um, per head of population for what they raise, it's um, quite incredible. So um, um, as I say, very very much um, one crew, and we do really appreciate. Um, all the work that they do. When you're doing fundraisers locally, does the money stay here or does it go to a uh, head office? Um, it all goes to all of the, the general donations go to, into the main, the main funds. But yeah. um, we, there have been in the past, um, legacies have been left, you know, people on the island have done that, which have been focused on 
they want those to go to local funding. So, you know, every year the R, you know, R station costs a certain amount of money a year to run and something called and that will just pay for the running of the station or various things things here so you can get ring fenced funds but i mean all of the donations that are raised through our all margaret's effort and her team's efforts go into into the main the, the main rli pot i mean I, I, can, I can remember a gentleman um it was a client of ours who had committed i think a million pounds um, towards the uh, RNLI in the hope of actually purchasing a lifeboat. Yeah. Of course, you know, nowadays that doesn't go very far, that million, does it? Well, it, I mean, it depends on, you know, there are inshore lifeboats, which mm. are the, you know, the smaller ones, which would come fall within that range yeah. to, to buy. So, you know, there are, there are things. But, I mean, when you get to the um, all-weather offshore lifeboats like we have here, um, you know, our boat, which is 30 years old this year, um, but that, when she was built um, at the time, was um, two and a half million pounds. That was 30 years ago. Yeah, sure. Um, the, the new lifeboats that are coming out now, the Shannons, they're, I think, over two million pounds per vessel. Mm. Um, so they are expensive bits of kit. Um, but, um, but yes, people do, um, you know, thankfully, you know, legacies do. They are a big part of the R&Li's um, funding, I think. Something like sixty percent of the R and Li's um, funding comes from legacies, and thirty percent is is sort of like donations, you know, flag days and all the fundraising activities, and then the other ten percent is from the sort of the shops and the merchandising yeah. that they do to, to make up. So, so a huge part is legacies, but also you know, again, thirty percent on donations is a is a big big number as well. Do you have any um, help over here for people that want to do a legacy? You know, on the mainland, you, you find a lot of charities these days will offer almost a will writing service. Um, is there anything like that available here? Yeah, well, they actually do 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 that. I mean, if you go on the RNI website, you will look on there. There are links through into how to to yeah. get involved in that. So they, I think they they do actually offer that. I'm pretty sure they offer that facility, which is you know you, they will the will will be done you know free of charge if there yeah. is a certain certain yeah. element going towards the RNI. So there is certainly links on the RNI um, webpage, and I'd encourage I'd encourage anyone like yourself to look at that for <laughs> future. <laughs> I right. haven't looked at it myself yet, but I will. I shall certainly think. Uh, I shall certainly give it due consideration, as we say. Now, let's get on to part two because you said you'd take us through the procedure, a fictitious, a fictitious scenario, where you're going to show us what actually happens, and I'm going to ask you a few questions, and hopefully, sure. you're, you're you're going to come up. So, um, we have this situation and uh, how do you actually receive the report in the first place that you've got to take the boat to sea? So we have a, um, so we've got a Coast Guard here in Alderney, which, um, so the majority of the calls will come via the Coast Guard. Um, right. Now, whether that is from, if the Coast Guard here, we're not a 20, it's not a 24 hour operation. So when they're shut, the Coast Guard in France and also the Coast Guard in Guernsey maintain a search and rescue watch for our area. So if something happens out of hours, they will call in the duty Coast Guard for Alderney who will come down the harbour and man up the Coast Guard station here. And the first thing that happens is they will call um, one of four people who are called launch authorities. So that is not myself. These are um, people, um, uh, they're not part of the crew, but they're very experienced and they're also trained by the RNLI in what is the appropriate tasking for a lifeboat? Mm. Now, you might think it's a very easy thing. You know, if someone calls for a lifeboat, you just send it. But there are lots of other considerations that come into that. Not so tricky with a lifeboat like ours because we are an all-weather lifeboat, so there is no limitation in the weather that goes out. But if you had an ILB station, there is a limit that ILBs can go out in maybe not more than a six one of them is, you know, you can't go out in more than a four six. So an ILB station, the Coast Guard might say, we've got someone, we need assistance, can you launch your ILB? The first point of contact is the DLA, who will say, well, actually, um, yeah, well, unfortunately, it is only a five where you are, but it is a six to seven sea state where we are, so we cannot 
you know, we, we cannot authorize the launch of that vessel, then the Coast Guard will go to another flank station who will have the appropriate asset that will launch. So this that is kind of like a safety net on 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 the on the weather side of things. But also what you do want to do is make sure that the vessel is tasked, that it is appropriate, that it isn't something that another commercial vessel could do because it's not a, um, a you know, a grave and imminent um, problem. So someone else might be able to provide a tow and it, it doesn't use a lifeboat's time. So that is the first thing. It goes to our, um, our, our launch authority and 99% of the time they will just say, they will get the information no, what is it? Yes, that's appropriate. Launch the lifeboat. Yeah. So then the Coast Guard basically presses a button on their call out thing and all of the crew are paged. So we operate a pager system. So we've all got pages. We've also got a similar thing on our phones. So they will go off and then everyone gets alerted and then they will uh, muster at the at the lifeboat station. So that is the, the first first thing. That's the first stage. Now, how many yeah. are there to the crew? How many crew? We, have, we have currently 18 on the crew. Yeah. Um, so and how many do you need to go out? We go to crew, we we come up with a minimum crew is six. Yeah. Um, although given certain situations, and I'll, I'll touch on them as we go carry on our conversation, you know, you will you can take more. So um, depending on the job. So, you know, everybody will rock up at the station. Obviously, we're a small island. Some people aren't available. So, you know, you generally will end up with, you know, 10 or 12 people. Um, so they, they'll come to the station. In the interim, more than likely, I've had a phone call from the launch authority to say the pages are going to go off in a minute. There is a, a yacht broken down in the, in the traffic separation scheme. That's the job, you know. So yeah. I will then be making my way to the station. Um, what happens then, everyone rocks up at the station and then we kind of fall into our training procedures where we approach it in a very sort of staged, logical way as to the information we get in. And that determines how we, how I, or the, whoever the coxswain is at the time, will organise the crew and what type of, um, you know, what the mission is we're going to do. And this is called a... Um, a SMEAC briefing, and um, we love our acronyms. So, I know um, that. Yes, so, I can so that. SMEAC stands for um, Situation, Mission, Execution, Administration, and Command. So right. those are the things that, and we've got, I don't have to remember all of that. We've got it all written on a nice board in our crew room. So it's a bit of a mem memory jogger. But it is a very, it's a very logical step that, uh, or process that you go through when you arrive at the crew room. So first of all, the situation is, you know, what is it? So what is the problem? Um, it's the yacht. It's broken down in the traffic separation scheme. Well, why is it broken down? Has it got a net round its rudder? So, um, or is it just mechanical failure? Or is it got um, and no wind? It can't sail. Um, how many people on board? You know, what is the weather situation? You know, these. This is all the information I'm getting in the the situation bit. Mm. Okay. So then it's the, you know, the mission. So what are we going to do? Well, you know, the yacht, we're going to go out and tow it in. We're going to get it out of the traffic separation scheme where it's in danger of being run down by ships. Um, so that is our mission. So that is, but we will come back to that as we go, go, yep. go out. So this is like our first stage of it. So then we get the execution, you know, what is the plan? Well, it's a yacht. We don't need to, um, uh, we're not into a search situation with people in the water, so we don't have to take extra crew. So that's fine. We're going to go with a crew of six, and that is we're going to go out and, and find it, locate it, and bring it back. So then we get onto the administration bit, and it's who is doing what. So I will, you know, I need someone to be in charge of engineering on the boat. I need a navigator. So as part of my crew, I'm looking at that and picking who is doing what. And then Finally, it's the command and the communication structure. And so I will brief the crew and say, you know, we are the only asset going um, and we are being coordinated by Alderney Coast Guard um, and on this particular instance. So no, and then we will. Yeah. Sorry. No, you keep going. Yeah. So so that is our briefing in the crew when everybody comes. So every out of my 10 or 12 people that have tipped up, I've gone through what the 
you know, what the situation is, what the mission is. Then we've picked our crew and then we will all be getting our kit on and then going out to our little rubber boarding boat to, to go and get onto the life. And this was the point I was going to make. I mean, um, unlike some lifeboat stations where they're actually physically on land, your lifeboat is moored in the open harbour and you go across in, in basically an inflatable. Um, are there any sort of limits as to the weather in that inflatable or do, do you just go? No, we um, the, the real challenging um, weather limits for that are a northeasterly in the winter because, yeah. um, as you know, in the summer we've got a pontoon in, which is, is fine, and the summer is generally you know good weather. Yeah. But when we get a northeasterly, the harbour is very exposed, and in in the winter we they take the pontoon out because it would break up if you left it in there. So we are on a um, on a on a mooring, an outhaul mooring, and you have to physically you know pull that mooring in and get the boat alongside the steps. And you can imagine you get a big swell rolling in there. You know you can can have you know two three two and a half meters swell rolling up and down those steps. So it that is can be very, very dangerous boarding that boat in those conditions. Thankfully, it doesn't happen that often. Yeah. Um, when it does, we will get two people on that boat, we'll let the mooring go, and then they will go to the main quay and pick up the rest of the crew. We won't all board it there, so we do it like that. But that is, you know, can be a, a, a quite a tricky time sometimes getting on the lifeboat. Um, but, um, but generally, you know, in terms of a, a call from someone you know the coast guard speaking to our launch authority for getting a call the page is being pressed we can be on the boat with engines being started ready to slip the mooring in you know eight to ten minutes so wow. um, it's it's a pretty you know obviously all the All, nowhere is far so um you know it's um it, it, it is quite a a swift operation you know when we get going yeah I'm, I'm very impressed eight minutes that's that's quite incredible isn't it yeah, I mean, now yeah. if you're um if you're going out to the you know the shipping lanes which are what 20 miles away oh dear Declan we seem to have lost your um you on vi uh, both bits Yeah. Okay, we're back on. And and we were at, at the eight it's minute. Not <laughs> <laughs> so as 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 far as you're concerned, uh, uh, what the question I put to you was, how long did it take to get out to the shipping lanes with the lifeboat? Well, we do. Um, uh, our boat is on average. 20 knots is is the speed of the boat so you know obviously you know we'll cover 20 nautical miles in an hour so traffic separation scheme you know 60 miles off so we're three quarters of an hour generally to to get into that area um you know what we do then is we are then en route to our our casualty you know our yacht which is broken down and everything is you know it you on board you are then receiving information you're trying to contact the casualty to establish communications with it so you can speak to it directly you're getting any updates on position changes from the coast guard or ideally the casualty because it's always good to speak to them um so you're you're building up you know more information as you go on um so that you because you know things can be they can change you know everything is a bit dynamic on a boat so you know you're getting all of that information en route you're gathering all of that again you're putting it in still into your SMEAC format if you yeah. like because it's yeah. still yeah. the yeah. mission what are we going to do and your execution as in to what your plan is might be changing so you might suddenly think oh we thought he just had machinery failure and we were going to tow him but no he's got a big trawl net round his rudder yeah so that instantly is a totally different thing because you can't tow him easily um you have to try and get rid of the the trawl net the rudder will be jammed over there's also you know so then you're thinking right okay when we get there we're in a situation whereby we're going to put two people on board the yacht initially to assess that particular um situation and then we'll build up a plan then 
Can we get rid of that net? No, we can't. We're going to have to try and recover it as best we can. You know, and then how do we tow it? And there are going to be all sorts of considerations around that. So again, you know, it's as you're going out, you know, you're getting all the information in to um, build up the best plan to do the job when you get there. And, and quite often you'd have a situation then where in the event of a machinery failure that you would actually tow back to Alderney. Yeah, I mean, we're, it, we're certainly not in the realms of trying to fix things. Um, no. Because unless it is very, very simple that, you know, a, a fuel lines come off or something like that. But generally you will, um, you know, put our tow on and, and recover them um, out of the, the danger area because, you know, we get, 300 odd ships a day go through that area and a small yacht is a very very small target and lots of these ships don't see these things so they there is a high risk of of, of being you know a collision there without anybody knowing so uh, you do want to get them out of the way um so you know a lot of our and again like we touched on earlier we would rather be called earlier than you know a situation whereby a yacht has got a huge ship bearing down on him and he's in danger of being run down and thinking goodness me what am i going to do now you know um, yeah. about to be in a collision here so um so i'd rather be there earlier than, um, than later so that, that, that's an interesting situation what if you've actually got somebody on board that's injured do you uh, uh, have to call in helicopters from time to time again you know this um comes back to if our original um call request that we've got for example it might be the yacht with someone has got an injury so yeah. it could be in the same place so <laughs> you might add so in that particular instance when we're doing our SMEAC briefing we know in you know there is a medical condition in this so when i am actually select doing the administration part of it and picking my crew i'm going to be thinking right i've got a first aid scenario going on here even though we have crew trained in first aid not all are trained in first aid and some are more proficient than others mm. so you know i will be looking at my selection of crew there and thinking right what i do want to do here is um um air on the side of having a strong team on the medical side so that is what i will be picking picking my crew for again you will be thinking i'm putting crew on a boat they might be recovering it back to the lifeboat they might be staying there to stabilize the position we then might be considering calling in a helicopter to come and uh, remove the casualty because it's often easier doing that rather than trying to transfer them across yeah. to the yeah. lifeboat mm -hmm. so all of these are considerations that again you are building up as you're going out to the particular job and getting all of that information information yeah, in. yeah. so and, and um, who, yeah. Which, who, who supplies the helicopter um, we have um, two helicopter assets. One is French, so yep. we will. Um, our first call in this, this area would be to the French Coast Guard for um, a helicopter uh, assistance. If they are unable to provide, and sometimes they're you know busy on on stuff as well, then we do have the uh, we could call the UK Coast Guard, and we would get the um, the helicopter from Lyon. It's based at Lyon Solent, so um, we get the Coast Guard helicopter to do that. Um, we do, uh, again, um, training is part, you know, a lot of lifeboating is training for all of these events. And we do, we do helicopter exercises regularly as well to, to ensure that we're all, um, you know, competent in operating with helicopters because it's um, uh, quite a, a noisy and uh, it can be a bit, you know, a bit um, chaotic at times. And if you've got a big swell, obviously the helicopter pilot's got a bit of a problem, as has the guy on the end of the rope. Yeah, I mean, well, they, they are, um, you know, they're extremely um, skilled and experienced um, pilots and winch operators. But yeah. what you do in, in very, in severe conditions or, you know, you in those conditions, you operate what is called a high line um, operation. So they will put out a line a weight with a line on initially and establish contact with the lifeboat so we've got a link um uh, to the helicopter and then you can help guide the uh, the winchman onto the deck of the lifeboat if the conditions are are that um that you know that that severe so um that is a, an operation that we we would do in those situations and have to do but um but we do get you know from time to time um, heli we work with helicopters and in fact we had an incident a couple of years ago uh, a very um, 
sad incident where there was um, a, a guy injured and a guy, in, in fact, died who was overboard from a French trawler just to about 10 miles west of here. And, uh, and we were dispatched. So again, on this particular one, we, we were, you know, tasked with, it was a man overboard. So we had, you know, person in the water. Um, this was from a, from a big commercial trawler, a man overboard and another guy on board who had been uh, got a severe injury to his um, to his to his arm and his chest um, in the, in an incident that had happened with this guy going overboard. So, you know, immediately we were thinking, so you, you've got, you know, first aid um, considerations there. Also, we had search. So we had um, again going out. We took some extra crew because if we are searching you know we do have things that we can use on board to search but you do yeah. need people with eyes out to to see that so that is a consideration um, and then also on this one as we're going out and building up that um, again information coming in and finding out that this man overboard is nowhere to be seen they've lost sight of him he's not near the trawler so you know instantly then you are requesting we requested more assets to go there um yeah. For example, a French helicopter to assist in in the operation, and also the conditions were such that it was it was rough. It was you know it was near gale force conditions, so instantly you know that transferring people onto a trawler to give medical assistance in itself is high risk and tricky. And if you can do that with a helicopter, then then that is a a better option. Than, yeah. than actually trying to do a boat to boat um, transfer. Yeah. So again, you know, it's information coming in, changing your plan and your ex execution on the mission that, that you're going to do to get a successful, successful outcome. And finally return to base. <laughs> and yeah, so absolutely. more it in the open harbour. And uh, well, I suppose yes. you drop the crew off on the pontoon, do you? Um, no, no, we'll go straight to to the mooring. Um, yeah. It depends on if we've been out on a on a on a relatively long um, shout, which can happen. You know, you can be out there. Some shouts are a couple of hours. Others can be. If it's a search, you could be out there for a long time. So yeah. you may have to um, uh, refuel. So if that's the case, we'll have to come alongside the key and, and refuel the lifeboat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then we'll go to the mooring, and then um, yeah, then we'll be. Um, uh, the boarding boat is either come out and pick us up again with some of the guys that are left ashore or we'll it will be on the mooring and we'll we'll come in and then what is important as well is you know that is not the end of our um our shout so um what we will do then is you know we will then you know obviously get our kit off and make sure everyone is is happy and comfortable but then we will have a debrief on what we did so yeah. Um, it's very important, um, you know, it closes everything off at the end and it is a very, very big learning thing for us as well. So, you know, we will go through various things on the de debrief about, you know, the safety of the operation. Were there any things that were flagged up that we noticed? Um, was anything done that was unsafe? So we've, got, so we've always got learning from everything we do. Would we have done that slightly differently? We might discuss that. You know, and again, obviously, everyone's welfare in that is everyone OK? And, you know, are yeah. there anything they want to talk about? Because, you know, over your lifeboating career, you will be subject to things that aren't very nice to see. And trauma. Deal yeah. with, and, yeah. um, and trauma does does affect people. Mm. So, um, mm. you know, something we have to be very, very conscious of as we do our job. Declan, it's been fascinating. You had your doubts about this, but <laughs> well, you, you've been I brilliant. wouldn't have my doubts when you put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> but I've really enjoyed talking to you. Wish you all the best for this uh, bicentenary year. Certainly be out and about, I'm sure, uh, if we can, to some of the functions. So, uh, right. you know, you're doing a great job, and so is the crew, and so are the volunteers. So on behalf of the general public, many, many thanks. Thank you, Tony. A pleasure. Okay, you take care. Thanks, Declan. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay.